this morning the Word of God came to us in a word of exhortation prophecy that said, God has called you, placed a calling on your life, brought you here for a purpose, some to be priests, some to be workers, but all to take part in the kingdom of God. Once again, let me say, I believe with all my heart we're not here by chance. I believe that God is not finished with Quinault. He is not abandoning us to go somewhere else, abandoning us to go somewhere else. He has a special plan for Quinault, and it's being worked out daily and weekly around us. You may say, but pastor, I'm here and I don't know what my position is. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. That's all right. God will reveal it to you as long as you seek him. The main thing is to stay open for what the Lord wants to do. How many have been coming to Wednesday evening service that could come? Some of you been here? How many are tired of hearing wives submit to your husbands? <laughs> How many wives are tired of hearing that? How many are tired of hearing husbands love your wives over and over and over? We've been on that for three weeks now. Dale, are we moving on from that? This week we move on. Okay. Un, not unfortunately, but because God probably planned it, Rusty finished with the 17th verse of Colossians chapter 3 last Sunday. A tremendous message that God ordained and blessed and anointed that if you didn't hear it, you need to get the tape. It was a tremendous message that God intended for our church to hear. And I think the highest praise I could give Rusty, I gave to him when it was over, I said, I wish I'd have said that. <laughs> But I know that it was God that gave him the word and it was a blessing to the church. But as he finished with that, I, I went to prayer this week and began to look in the word of God to see where we were going this week on into the book of Colossians. And guess what the 18th verse says? <laughs> Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And the next verse says, husbands, love your wives. Do not be bitter toward them. And I said, Lord, I have heard enough about this lately. I'd like to take it from a different spot. As many of you have heard us say many times and all of you are aware of, our world is in a, a precarious spot today. Our nation is, our um, homes, our families, all of our, just, we're just in a, in a troubled place. I want to read a, uh, something that Shelley gave me this morning. It has to do with a drug problem. The other day, someone at a store in our town read that a meta, um, methamphetamine lab had been found in an old farmhouse in the adjoining county, and he asked me a rhetorical question. Why didn't we have a drug problem when you and I were growing up? I replied, I had a drug problem when I was young. I was drugged to church on Sunday morning. I was drugged to church for weddings and funerals. I was drugged to family reunions and community socials, no matter the weather. I was drugged by my ears when I was disrespectful to adults. I was also drugged to the woodshed when I disobeyed my parents, told a lie, brought home a bad report card did not speak with respect, spoke ill of the teacher or the preacher, or if I didn't put forth my best effort in everything that was asked of me. I was drugged to the kitchen sink to have my mouth washed out with soap if I uttered profanity. I was drugged out to pull weeds in my mom's garden and flower beds and cockleburs out of dad's fields. I was drugged to the homes of family, friends, and neighbors to help out some poor soul who had no one to mow the yard, repair the clothesline, or chop some firewood. And if my mother had ever known that I took a single dime as a tip for this kindness, she would have drugged me back to the woodshed. <laughs> Those drugs are still in my veins, and they affect my behavior in everything I do, say, or think. 
They are stronger than cocaine, crack, or, her or heroin. And if today's children had this kind of drug problem, America would be a better place. God bless the parents who drugged us. I'd like to speak to parents and to families today. The Lord willing, over the next three Sundays, we'll be speaking about families. We're going to be speaking in three different areas, especially for toward the parents and children. One area would be, would be the responsibility of education. One would be the responsibility of encouraging them. And one would be the responsibility of disciplining them. We're going to speak to those three areas because how many, has, is there anyone here besides Rusty and me and maybe Carmen that has seen a, a documentary film called Agenda? Anybody seen that film? Let me tell you what, guys, that film is definitely a must-see. It will stop you in your tracks. It'll make you aware of the fact that Satan has a plan that goes way back, but it comes right up till today. It's still working. As I heard that, I was reminded of a scripture that said that Satan had came, has come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. To kill, to steal, and destroy. He's killed dreams. He's killed hopes. He's killed America in many ways. He stole just about everything we've had. Now he's set about to destroy us. Not as we thought he was going to do with nuclear warfare or something like in the Cold War all that time. But he's set about to destroy us from the inside out. And let me tell you what. If you watch that film, you'll see that he's been quite successful. But God is greater. Amen. And we're blessed that we live in a small little community in Quinault, that God is moving on, and that we can affect as the body of Christ. We can make a difference here. We don't have to let Satan run over the top of us like he maybe is doing in Seattle or Tampa or somewhere, I don't know where, someplace else. But we have an opportunity right here. As you're looking, if you look across this congregation, at least 10% of the people in this community are sitting in here this morning. Our community is about 800 and some odd people now. And at least 10% of our community is sitting inside the church today. 10% is a good group. When Abraham was praying to God for Sodom, he started out with 50, but he got down to a, a mighty small bunch. And God says, yes, I'll save them. If there are just 10 people there, I'll save them. Save that city. God is, is going to, definitely wants to, it's within his plan, change and affect Quinault for the kingdom. Just outside these doors, there are many people. Sunday nights, we've been praying for the church with a special prayers that we've been, that we've put together, 12 specific prayers for the church. And then we've also put a, a prayer list together of people in the community that we're praying for. And we've added to that prayer list some people that individuals of us have just added on there because they've been on our hearts for so long, we can't pray without mentioning them. And God is reaching out and touching the people across our community. You're going to watch and we're going to see as God moves. Every time that God lays it on the hearts of his people to pray, it's because there's a move of God coming. And it's coming, folks. It's just around the corner. I know you say, well, Pastor, you've been saying this for years. Yes, I've been saying that Jesus is coming back for years. And all I can prove to you now is we're closer to it now than we were the first time I said it. Isn't there a night that we can set aside so that we can, and somebody that we can watch it here at the church? Certainly, we can do that. We'll, we'll plan on that. Let's, uh, let's make a little, put a little thought into it, and we'll think about that, and we'll announce it. Yeah, that is a, it's a definitely a, a, a movie that you need to see. Yeah, I'm not seeing. Yeah. 
So I want you to, I want you to be looking forward to that. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. As you know, we've already finished many times over Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24, 25, right in there, all through there. And I will say, Dale has done a very good job. He has not split the church <laughs> with his teaching, even though some ladies were a little bit... I won't say anything. I'm going to let it go. <laughs> this, is a, this is not a hard subject, folks. It's not a hard subject to teach. It's not a hard subject to understand. It's just a hard subject to accept. The reason it's a hard subject to accept is because it's not the way of the world. We've been raised, let's just go back for just a couple minutes here. We've been raised, the, uh, most, some of you, how many were born before 1960? You don't have to tell me your age, but born before 1960. If you were born before 1960, you probably remember a different world than we're living in now. You probably had a mother who maybe stayed at home and a father who went to work. And you maybe had a, uh, maybe your parents took you to church on a regular basis. And you maybe even had family devotions in your home. And chances are, your parents even knew your school teachers by name. It wasn't so hard when I went to school because we only had four teachers in the school. We had two, two grades in each, for each teacher in the eighth grade, up through the eighth grade. So it wasn't too hard to know all four teachers and the principal. Just hard to get along with them. It wasn't hard to know them. But I, I, I will say this, I was raised in a Leave it to Beaver home where everything was just like you'd expect a home to be. I never heard my mom and dad quarrel. And the only time I knew that they quarreled was if mom pouted. If mom was pouting, I knew that her and dad had probably had, a, had an argument. But I never heard them raise their voice to one another, I never heard them quarrel, and I, and I, know, I knew that dad was going to make the final decision. Mom may have discussed it with him, she may not even have been happy about it, but dad made the final decision. It wasn't hard in our home. So as I watched that happen as I was growing up from a little boy, when I come to my teens, my dad took me aside and said, son, let me explain something to you. I know what's right and wrong. I'm going to tell you so you won't have to make the decision on your own. Because he didn't think I could make the right decision, probably. So he told me, you're not going to go there, and you're not going to do that. You are going to do this, whether you like it or not. It was real simple in those days. And I really didn't have a choice. And it was okay. I trusted my dad with my life and my future. There are those right now that are taking their children at a fairly young age, maybe 12, 13 years old, setting them aside and saying, would you listen to me while, would you trust me with your teen years? Interesting thing, did you know that there were no teenagers in the Bible? Teenagers, teenage didn't exist in Bible times. They may have been 13, 14, or 15, but if you were 13 in the Jewish culture, you were a man. Somewhere along the line, out of the kindness of our hearts, we created teenage. To allow the kids to make some mistakes, to allow them to get in lots of trouble and forgive them because they're just teenagers. So we gave them this slack period. You know what happened? They started making the mistakes just like we expected of them. So then when they got a little older, we said, boy, you know, they're 18. They're still making those mistakes. I'll bet you we better run the age on up to about 22. 
So now we've ran the age up to 22. Because if, you're, if your child goes to college, you're responsible to them for them until they're 22 years old. So we've cut slack a lot of places and let, let the kids be kids, be teenagers on up through that age. Not necessarily God's plan, but one that we've made. Now, you, you're saying, where are you going, Pastor? And I'm saying, I don't know, but it's okay. Now we're going to read Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Now let's go back over to Colossians. Chapter 3, verse 18. Where it says, wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. I'd like to just mention one thing as we go past 18 and 19, because like I said, we've discussed it. I'd like to just mention one thing at the end of verse 19. Do you see that scripture there? It says, husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. You think, well, why, why would the Lord put that in there? Why would the Lord put that in there? Do not be bitter toward them. It's because husbands have the ability to cover things up that you never see. How many know still water runs deep? You know, and guys just don't let their emotions out. The wives, if they got something to say, they say it. If they feel bad, they cry. All these things. But if a guy, if a guy's hurt or a guy's something, he just buries it. Just puts it down inside of him and stifles it. And you don't know it. Maybe it'll come out somewhere a little bit along the line, but most of the time, you don't even know it. But do you know that that causes a root of bitterness many times in a person? Toward their wives, sometimes toward their children, sometimes toward their mother-in-law or somebody else. And that can cause just a root of bitterness to spring up there inside of a person. Husbands and fathers, check your hearts. Is there something that has happened? I'll just bring one out here. It's not a case in my, in my family because we don't have that much, but maybe your wife spends too much money. Maybe you're working every day as hard as you can work and your wife's spending more money than you're making. And you know if you say anything, she's going to say, well... I'm just doing what I got to do to keep this family together. I'm just making it happen. I'm just paying the bills. I'm just, and you've got to listen to all that, and you don't want to hear it. And so you just stuff it down inside you, and you let her go and spend the money. And bitterness creeps in there. You still love her. You don't understand her, but you love her. And the root of bitterness comes down in there. That's why Paul said, don't let bitterness get there. We could use many other scenarios, but I just used that one. Bitterness can sometimes creep in. We want to keep, make sure that we get rid of bitterness. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Husbands, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Children, obey your parents in all things. I've raised five children of my own, and I had some others that I helped raise. I made a lot of mistakes, and I wish... I wish, Mindy, I could do a bunch of them over. We don't get that chance. Once you make the mistake, it's over and done with. You go on and live with it. You maybe can correct it next time and not make the same mistake again, but that mistake was made. 
I'd like to take each one of you, parents, and sit out with you. Say, let me tell you the mistakes I made so you don't have to make them. Let me tell you about getting so busy, not sinning. I'm not talking about sinning. I'm talking about working. I'm talking about being involved in the church. Getting so busy that you don't have time for your kids. Just too busy. And so what you do is you turn your responsibility over. It's getting me good preaching now, guys. Listen. You turn your responsibility over to your wife. And you say, you're with the kids more than I am. That's your responsibility. It's your responsibility to teach them what God's Word says. It's your responsibility to teach them how to behave. It's your responsibility to teach them uh, all, everything. Well, in fact, teach them manners. Teach, teach them everything. You're the wife. You're their mother. You take care of everything. I'm going to go be too busy doing my thing. You know what happens? The mother can't do it all. So you know where she goes? She bundles those little bundles up every morning, five days a week, and joyfully takes them to the school bus and sends them to school and says, I'm giving you my responsibility. You raise my kids for six to eight hours a day. You take care of them. You discipline them. You teach them manners. You teach them to be respectful. You teach them everything, including their education. You teach it all to them. And you know what the school does? The school says, we've got an open door. We'll teach them whatever we want. Our school is blessed is really blessed. And you know why? Because we have about a third of the school, maybe more, are born-again Christians that love the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm excited about that. And they are ready to teach, not only to teach them the curriculum to read and write and do arithmetic, but they're also ready to teach them what's right and what's wrong. I ask you, teachers, please, we have given you the best we have. And somehow the state has declared that we're going to give it to you so many hours a day, so many weeks out of the year. I ask you, please, love our kids, but turn some of the responsibility back to us, would you? I mean, tell me, your grandson needs help. He's living with you. He's not brought a book home this year. I didn't know the truth was going to come out quite like this. But you know what? He still pulls good grades. How does that happen? I'm not, a, I'm not even as smart as he is, I know, but I brought home, I could hardly carry my books I brought home at night. I had to work at it. You know one of the reasons, though, why it was more difficult? Because my dad, at the first of every school year, says, Son, I'd like to know what classes you're going to be taking. Well, Dad, I got two, two study halls lined up, a PE, and I think uh, maybe band and chorus. Yeah, lunch. Yeah, lunch. And I think, no, no, I, I never did take shop. That's the one thing I should have taken. I didn't take shop. I, I ended up with all of those things. I did take band and chorus and all of those things. But you know what Dad would say? He'd say, let me help you with that, son. You're going to take a math every year in high school. You're going to take some math every year. But, Dad, I'm not good at math. That's why you're going to take math. He said, you're going to take a math. You're going to take English. In fact, it would be good for you to take Latin. I said, Dad, nobody speaks Latin. He said, I know. You'll be a one of a kind. <laughs> you're going to speak Latin when you're done. I took two years of Latin, and I'm very thankful because I know the words and the derivatives and all that stuff that goes along with it, and it really was a blessing to me to take Latin. 
He said, you're going to take speech. I said, you only get into speech class by invitation. He said, then get invited. <laughs> he was involved with my education. He was involved with my after-school curricular, after-school activities. He knew where I was. You say, how was your home structure? Well, let me tell you, I didn't have an end time. I'm not saying this is right. You structure your home the way God tells you to. I didn't have a time I had to be home. I could be out as late as I wanted to, as long as mom and dad knew exactly where I was and what I was doing. And I knew that as soon as I called and said, hey, mom and dad, I'm down here at a party, they'd say, then come home. <laughs> but I, I called and I always told them, this is where I am, this is what I'm doing. And really, where I lived, they rolled up the sidewalks. If there was a sidewalk, they rolled it up at 7 o'clock at night. So there was no sense being out late anyway. That wasn't what we did. But, but I, I will tell you this. My parents were involved in my life. Parents, you need to be involved in your kids' life. Now, I know that there's a lot of you here that aren't, that aren't parents now. You're, well, your parents, some of you are parents, but you're grandparents. You don't have little children anymore. You're not raising little children anymore. You should be. You should be helping your children raise your grandchildren. One of the things that I missed the most growing up was I didn't have a grandparent close by. My grandparents were all, they passed away by the time I was four. So my parents went out and found grandparents for me because my dad said, you need a grandparent. You need somebody you can go to and have a cookie and tell them your problems and this type of thing. When you get mad at me, you can go talk to somebody else. And I did. I went and found a, I, I remember John and Maude breeding. They weren't even Christians, but they were wonderful grandparents. I'd go to her house and she'd make mashed potatoes and give me canned milk and I'd put canned milk on my mashed potatoes. Man, I can still taste it. That was so good. <laughs> I know, you're thinking it was a little strange, but it wasn't, it was good. <laughs> if you do not have a child in your life, find one and bring them into your life and love them and pray for them and encourage them and feed them a cookie or take them with you on a trip or do something that's fun with them and something that's fun for you and enjoy that child's life but speak into it. Love that child and speak into their life. Do you know how many homes in America are broken now? Do you realize that over half of the marriages, we did two marriages yesterday, and if statistics are right, one of them will be divorced within a few years. And the statistics are worse in the church than they are in the world. Divorce is rampant. You know, you say, you look at your, our children and you say, look at the mess they're in. How can they be doing that? What's wrong with them? I'll tell you what's wrong with them. Mom and dad never stayed together long enough to give them a stable environment to grow up in. Good preaching here. Amen. It's true. Mom and dad didn't stay together and give them a stable environment, some place where they could come and feel safe, some place where they could come and know that they were loved, somebody that would look after them and care for them while they grew up. The Bible says, train up your child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. Turn with me real quick over to Genesis chapter 18. I'm going to start winding down here pretty soon. Genesis chapter 18. Everybody that knows Genesis knows that we're going to be talking about Abraham. Maybe the first book in the Bible, but it's sure hard to find the 18th chapter. Man. Hang on, I'm getting there. Genesis 18, verse 19. This is God speaking of Abraham just before Sodom and Gomorrah. 
and God speaks of Abraham and he says, for I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. The Lord knew Abraham and he knew that Abraham was going to train his children. That he was going to, he was going to love his children and he was going to train his children as he did with Isaac, we know. And we know that as we look through God's word, we see all the different scenarios where that children were, were prayed for and brought Hannah and different ones and how they were loved and, and encouraged. And, and we see that all the way through that God intended for the fathers to have the responsibility of being the head of their household and raising their children. Maybe I should say that again. God intended and intends today for fathers to take the responsibility for their families and raise them in a godly influence, the responsibility for the wife and the children, stand up and be men. God intends that for you and I. We've laid our responsibility down in many areas, but it doesn't change the fact that it's still there. Mothers, I've listened to some stuff on the news lately. It just makes me, it makes me think the world is sick. When they talk about the fact that motherhood is, is somewhere below other, other statuses in life. Let me tell you what. The Lord Jesus Christ came into this world through his mother Mary. And she was a guiding influence in his life right up until the cross. And she was there at the day of Pentecost. So don't tell me that the mother isn't important in the home. So as Mary raised Jesus, a story I just love. Jesus did everything perfect, right? Sure he did. He, was, he didn't sin. But he did something that would, would have caused you a lot of anguish and grief. How about if um, Rebecca, let's say Rebecca, went to camp with a whole group of kids from camp, with the, with the pastor and a whole bunch of good, good quality folks. And you went too. Okay, and you, and when you got to camp, you had a wonderful time, and you all jumped on the bus and you headed home, on the three different buses, and you had a wonderful trip home, had a great time coming home, and when you got here and you got off the bus, you looked around, and lo and behold, there was no Rebecca. And you said, uh, Gary, have you seen Rebecca? No. Carmen, have you seen Rebecca? No. Has anybody seen Rebecca? No. When was the last time we saw Rebecca? Well, I saw her over there by the, by the snack bar just before we left camp. You think she might still be at camp? No, that's not possible. Yep. Let's check and see. Today we'd call. In those days they couldn't call. They made the trek clear back there. And sure enough, Jesus was in the temple. They looked for him for three days. Don't tell me Mary wasn't panicky. She cried a few tears. She worried herself sick. And she found Jesus. And you know the interesting thing? Jesus said, don't you know I need to be about my father's business? And it says Mary marveled. But he came home and was subject to her until his ministry started at a later year, years later. 30. 30 years old. I believe that Jesus provided for her during that time. Uh, during that time, I think that was part of his responsibility, was taking care of his mother. But he came home and behaved himself. Yes. 
Even though he was the king of kings, the lord of lords, and he was a, to, to be about his father's business, he came home and, behaved, and obeyed his mom. So don't tell me, kids, that you shouldn't obey your mom. Jesus did. And even though he branched out there at that one time and kind of did what we'd consider his own thing, Mary came and got him and brought him home. That speaks to me of two things. One is parents, know where your kids are and go get them. Love them and bring them home. I don't know if you've ever had a child run away. We did. I watched a mother self-destruct in three days' time right in front of my eyes as our, as our daughter ran away. We looked for her everywhere. Finally found her. Eight hours away. I still remember what I said. I called her up and I said, you got eight hours to run because I'm going to come find you. <laughs> she was waiting. She wanted to come back home. We as parents love our kids. Go find them. Go get them. Love them. Keep working with them. And, and kids, oh, honor your mother and father. The Bible says if you do it, you'll, you'll live long on the land, and it'll be well with you. You know what? Not just little kids. Not just teenagers. How about adults? Do we still honor our mother and father? I wish my mother and father was here so I could honor them. They've been gone for a while now. I still miss them. Take a look at my notes here. One last thing I'm just going to come to. And we'll, we'll cover much of this in a later date, but I didn't choose this particular portion of Scripture. It just came in, in line. But I do want to say something. Where it says, fathers, do not provoke your children, but uh, lest they become discouraged. We've got children. My, my kids are all grown. All five of them are grown. They've all left home and come back and left and come back and left. Not all of them. Some of them did, though. That's okay. And some of them have gone through some hard times, and I love them more because of it. You don't love them less. You love them more because of the hard times they go through. And the other day, as I was standing there working alongside of Rachel, she looked over at me and she said, do you ever think that maybe you made some mistakes while you were raising your kids? I said, no, I know I made some mistakes while I was raising my kids. I know I didn't do it all right. And I know that probably some of the reasons they are like they are is because of dad. But I'm also going to tell you this. And fathers, listen to me. There is an enemy of your soul, but it's also an enemy of your children's soul. Satan himself would destroy the family from within and he would take away your responsibility and your ability to minister to your kids. And if you, prom if you stand on the promises of God's word, you can, realize, you can believe that God will bring back that opportunity to minister to your children again and again and again. Even to the point that they're 30 years old or 40 years old. And you still have an opportunity to love them and minister to them. As my daughter, Coral, it's not a secret. You all know where she is. You know what? I'm proud of her for where she is. My daughter, Coral's at the cross dealing with a situation in her life. I know a lot of people that haven't gone there and dealt with anything. So I'm proud of her for dealing with it. But before she left, she wrapped her arms around me, said, Dad, I'm sorry. I said, Coral, I'm sorry. But 
But I also remember, I also realized that I'd got an opportunity once more to pray for her, love her beyond anything you know, and see her healed and restored better than ever. And that's what we believe for. We're in the, we're in the business of believing in change, aren't we, April? We're seeing change. There's not a family here that hasn't been touched by drugs or alcohol or something along that line. And we're going to see God minister more and more and more. And as we watch the healing power of Jesus, the transforming and changing power of the Lord Jesus Christ, we realize that only God can take the messes that we make, straighten them out. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, today has been somewhat of a confessional, and it's also been somewhat of a, of a challenge, but Lord, it's also been the revealing of your, of your Father's heart to us. And God, I pray that you would um, speak to every father here and mother and child. But Lord, I pray that you'd especially speak to the fathers and the grandfathers. And Lord, those that can be fathers that maybe aren't, that would take on a child and love them and father them. God, would you speak to us and have us to look at our responsibility and, and see whether or not we've turned over our responsibility to someone else. Or maybe we need to pick up and shoulder more of that load and do what you'd have us to do. Lord, maybe the message that you brought from Fairly to the congregation is that you have called us to be parents. Some of us you've called to be parents and given us the greatest opportunity there ever was to form those little lives. Help us, Lord, as we do that. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Does anyone have a bulletin handy? I'd like to read something right here. Thank you. I'd like to read something from your bulletin. The essence of Christian nurturing is the heart of a father being turned toward the children so that the heart of the children will be turned toward the Savior.